Uh, we'll just uh, we'll just get started. Um, just make sure. Okay, it's running. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to be back with all of you uh, after being gone in Chicago last weekend. Did anybody watch any of the studies over the internet? I saw you post. Did you watch all of them, Mike? Or? No. Okay. Were your ears bleeding when I was talking about you? <laughs> no, I missed that part. You missed that part. Okay. <laughs> Well, somebody, I mentioned, I mentioned the fact that you had loaned me that study Bible, and I read from it. And then uh, at the end, there was a little bit of Q and A time, and somebody asked me, you know, where I got all this stuff. And so I mentioned that we had a collector in our assembly that helped me with gathering the information and and so on. Um, so we did make sure that we mentioned where we got some stuff from. That's for all those phone calls. <laughs> you got a phone call? No. Oh. <laughs> it's my one joke of the year. So. But it, it was a good one too. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. So anyway, we had a you know we had a, we had a good time. Uh, the stuff that the stuff that I presented was largely stuff that I've already talked to you folks. <coughs> so that was good that I had the benefit of having gone through it one time already um, before I presented it to a more. Uh, wider audience, but the, uh, the the general consensus from what I gathered was a lot of surprised people with just how much of this stuff was known and when it, and the time frame that it was known in, um, was, was uh, a definitely new information to a lot of, to a lot of people. Now, um, we're going to, we're, we're continuing this morning, this is technically Lesson 66, um, because lesson 65, we didn't end. It, we didn't finish everything that was in the notes. And um, if you look at the calendar, it's obvious that we are not going to finish it this before June. And I'm going to have to extend this study yet another um, little while after summer vacation. So I, I, um, I hope that. You all, I know the group has dwindled, okay, so I, I, I hope that by the time we're done, it's not just me talking to the paint, um, but I, I hope that those of you that have been coming faithfully are enjoying it to en enough to forbear with me as we go uh, a little further yet beyond the end of this school year. Um, I think it's important that we do that just for the sake of being complete and so on, and some of you are laughing, and that's fine, but um, we, where we left off two weeks ago was we were in the middle of talking about the writings of C.H. McIntosh, and we were discussing some things uh, regarding what, how we should view McIntosh and how other people have viewed McIntosh and his writings. And just, just, just a couple things. The, the thing that we've been looking at for C.H.M. is the life and times of Elijah. Kind of an interesting place to find the type of information that we've been looking at regarding dispensational truth, but uh, McIntosh uh, writes about it. Remember what we said a couple weeks ago that Moody, D.L. Moody, said that he could do away with all the books in his library except his Bible and the writings of McIntosh uh, because they were so influential on influential on his thinking and so forth. He said he could do away with every other book that he owned in his library except the, the writings of McIntosh and his Bible. And so we were looking at some things, and I just want to review. We, if I go back over all the same ground, we won't get any further than we did last time. But it's clear that McIntosh says that the church does not start in Acts 2. Okay? And in fact, to be, to be precise, I need to erase that and back up even further. If you remember, and you can, if you weren't here, you can go back and look through the notes. He says that John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and the Twelve... Are all deal are all offering the kingdom to who? To, to the nation of Israel. He talks about how Acts two and the beginning chapters of the book of Acts at least are not are are not the church. They're not the church, the body of Christ. He talks about how in Acts chapter three the kingdom is being offered to the nation of Israel by the apostle Peter. Then we also looked at if you go to Acts fifteen how Paul. When he goes to the Jerusalem Council, he knows the mystery, but he only tells a few people. Go to go, turn your Bible quickly, if you would, back to Galatians chapter 1. 
Now, again, I, I'm, I'm trying to draw up here on the board stuff that we spent a lot of time going over uh, for the sake of review, since it's been two weeks since we were looking at these things. Galatians chapter 2, uh, verse 1. Then 14 years, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, uh, and I went up to Revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. Now, if he's going up in Acts 15 to the Jerusalem Council to communicate the gospel that he preached among the Gentiles, then was he clearly preaching it before Acts 15? Yes. Yes, he was. Okay? And it says, But privately to them which are of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So McIntosh says that Paul knows his gospel, he knows the mystery in Acts 15, but he chooses to only tell a few people about it. Okay? Where we, where we left off, so he, so he has Paul knowing the mystery during his Acts ministry. During Paul's Acts ministry. But he also says that during the Acts ministry, so uh, let's just draw this in here. We'll just say um, Acts 9 was when he gets, Saul gets saved. So we'll go from Acts 9 to Acts 28. So we'll call this uh, Paul's Acts ministry from Acts, you know, obviously from Acts 9 to Acts 28 to whatever degree. He obviously doesn't leave to go anywhere to, on, on his first apostolic journey till Acts 13. But this whole time period here, he says, Paul knows the mystery. At some point, understanding it, he doesn't specify where, but he knows it by the time he goes to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. And he says that during this time, Paul is torn between two, two forces, if you will. Okay, The first one is the new revelation that's been given to him. The make, and, and making known this new revelation. The second is his... Um, affection for Israel. So, he knows this, he has a desire to make known this revelation, but because of his affection for Israel, he holds back on making it known in this time period here from Acts chapter, we'll just say from, it, from when he begins his ministry in Acts 13 all the way through here to Acts chapter 28. So he, he, he defines or views or paints a situation where Paul sort of is, is torn between these two things. His affection for his kinsmen according to the flesh of the nation of Israel, and also for this new deposit of information that's been made known to him by revelation, and so on. Okay. Now, the other thing that, well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. The reason that this comes into play, and I think we should go back in our notes to page 9... Actually, go to the bottom of page 8. This is backing up slightly from where we left off. We ended by discussing whether or not Macintosh should be viewed as an Acts 28 dispensationalist. Okay? So if you look at the very bottom of page 8, it says... Uh, hang on, let me make sure, double check, that's what I want. Go up to halfway down page 8, where it says, Based upon. Based upon the preceding quotation, Paul delayed the widespread proclamation of his gospel because Jerusalem was not ready to hear it. It is also clear that Macintosh viewed Paul's ministry as totally separate, distinct from any earthly, human, and Jewish element. McIntosh appears to be saying that as of Acts 15, Paul knew that his commission and revelation were unique and distinct. However, he chose not, to, chose not to proclaim his gospel widely at that time. After a lengthy section where he surveys the events of the final chapters of Acts, McIntosh says the following regarding Paul's departure from Jerusalem for Rome. Quoting McIntosh, Now Paul's departure may be looked upon as a meaning precursor of all this. The peculiar truth of which he was the depository could only be brought out in all its fullness and power in connection with the abandonment of earth and the manifested scene of divine operation. Okay, so understand. He's saying that when, when Paul leaves to go to Rome, 
Okay? Does he know what this divine revelation that's been deposited to his account is? He does know it, but has he fully proclaimed it yet? No. No, okay? So he says, it's not until the city of Jerusalem is abandoned. Look at, look, look at this statement again. With the abandonment of earth is the manifest scene. Hence, Paul's journey from Jerusalem to Rome must be viewed with deepest interest by the, by the intelligent and reflecting Christian. Okay? So again, he says that before he goes to act to Rome and ends up there in the end of the book of Acts, does he already know this information? Yes. Yes. But has he fully made it known yet? No. no. But he knows it. He hasn't fully made it known yet. And the reason he hasn't is because of his affection for his kinsmen according to the flesh, the nation of Israel. Now, careful readers will note the following sentence. The peculiar truth of which he was the depository could only be brought out in all its fullness and power in connection with the abandonment of earth as the manifest scene of divine operation. According to Macintosh, Paul knew the mystery, i.e. the peculiar truth of which he was a depository, before Acts 28. Moreover, since it could only now, now upon leaving Jerusalem, be brought out in all its fullness and power, it must have experienced a limited proclamation previous to Acts chapter 28. So it's limited, he's, he knows it, and he has in some cases and instances said something about it, but has he fully explained it and developed it fully yet? Not according to what Macintosh is saying. Okay. Now understand again that I'm trying to explain to you what Macintosh said about these things. Now, bottom of the page. McIntosh's comments on Acts 28.28 have led some to conclude that he was teaching the Acts 28 position, i.e. that the body of Christ started in Acts 28, and uh, it is best to consider McIntosh in his own words. Now go to Acts 28.28 also. Now I want to say something while you turn there. I thought about these things. McIntosh well, let, let me back up even further. Holden. Holden would have never said, I'm a mid-ax dispensationalist. Because did they even speak in those terms back then? No. We can read back on the things that he said and see that they are very much in line with what a modern mid-ax dispensationalist would say. But would Holden have ever called himself that? So it is with Macintosh. Would Macintosh have ever said, I'm an Acts 28 dispensationalist? I don't believe that he would. But some of the things that he does right seem to have a, a, an agreement with what a modern Acts 28 dispensationalist would say. Okay? So much like I would, just like I, I or any other mid acts dispensationalist could read Holden and see, a, and see an affinity in what he had to say with what we have to say, I think some Acts 28 dispensationalists now, looking back, reading Holden, have, have, have thought similar things uh, I'm sorry, about Macintosh, uh, and I want to try to explain to you why I believe that to be the case. Okay, So quoting now from Macintosh, There was now no, no more hope. This is his comments on Acts 28. Every effort that love could, have, that love could make had been made, but to no purpose. And our apostle, with a reluctant heart, shuts them up under the power of that judicial blindness, which was the natural result of their rejection of the salvation of God. Thus every obstacle to the clear and full development of Paul's gospel was removed. He found himself in the midst of the wide Gentile world, a prisoner at Rome, the re and rejected of Israel. He had done his utmost to tarry among them. His affectionate heart led him to delay as long as possible, ere he would reiterate the, the prophet's verdict, but now all was over, every uh, expectation was blasted. All human institutions and associations present to, his, present to his view, nothing but ruin and disappointment. He must therefore set himself to bring out the holy and heavenly mystery, which had been hidden God from ages and from generations, the mystery of the church as the body of Christ united to its living head in heaven. Thus closes the Acts of the Apostles which, like the Gospels, is more or less connected with the ministry to Israel. So long as Israel could be regarded as the object of testimony, so long as that testimony continued, but when they were shut up to judicial blindness, 
they cease to come to come within the range of testimony whereof they whereof that uh, where up sorry wherefore the testimony ceased. Now, when you read that, does it sound like he's saying that the church starts in Acts twenty eight? How many of you kind of see that? I can kind of see that. I can see where somebody would, would think that that's what he's implying. Now, does he explicitly say the church started in Acts 28? He does not. Okay, let's go on. But there could be numerous degrees of elevation as re evaluation as regards the standing of the saints. For example, a saint in the opening of Acts had higher privileges than a saint under the law of Moses. The prophets, John, our Lord in His personal ministry and the Twelve, all brought out varied aspects of the believer's position before God. But Paul's gospel went far beyond them all. It, is not, it was not the kingdom offered to Israel on the ground of repentance as John the Baptist and our Lord, nor was it the kingdom opened to Jew and Gentile by Peter in Acts 3 and Acts 10. But it was the heavenly calling of the church of God, composed of Jew and Gentile in one body, united to a glorified Christ by the presence of the Holy Ghost. The epistle to the Ephesians fully develops the mystery of the will of God concerning this. Now it's interesting. Notice what he says. The epistle of the Ephesians fully what? Develops. Develops. Okay? Now during this Acts ministry, he also writes... 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, he writes Galatians, he writes Romans, and he writes Corinthians. Okay? These are all written before when? Before Acts 28. Okay? Just real quick, go, go to Romans 16. Romans 16.25 Romans 16.25 Now to him there's a power to establish you according to my gospel notice and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest. Does he mention at the end of the book of Romans the revelation of the mystery? So does he know about the mystery during the Acts period, I believe around Acts chapter 20, when he writes the book of Romans? Yes. Obviously he does. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse uh, 7. 1 Corinthians 2, 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, is he talking about knowing and proclaiming the wisdom of God and mystery? Yes. So, does he understand some things about the mystery during the Acts ministry? Yes. And he writes about them in a limited way. Okay? Go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, look at verse um, 11. Now I'm just picking a few. There's other verses we could look at in this regard, but we don't have time to look at all of them. Galatians chapter 1, But I certify you, brother, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Drop down to the verse we just read, chapter 2, verse 1. That fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preached among who? But where did he get the gospel that he preached among the Gentiles from, according to chapter 1, verse 11 and 12? He got it by the, from the direct revelation of who? Jesus Christ. So during the Acts period, has Paul clearly been receiving revelation from Christ? Okay? The revelation has something to do with his gospel, and it has something to do, in, a, in at least some way, shape, manner, form, with the mystery. Now, go back to your notes, page 9, and read the uh, second paragraph from the bottom. The epistle of the Ephesians fully develops the mystery of the will of God. Is it true 
that the fullest explanation of the mystery comes in Ephesians and Colossians. Yes. That is absolutely true. But it is not true to maintain that you cannot find it at all before these books right here. Because I just showed you in the verses that he's already discussing it. He's not flushing it out in all the detail that he does here in Ephesians or Colossians. But the point is, is it there in that testimony during the Acts period? Okay? So he says, the Epi Macintosh says, the epistle to the Ephesians fully develops the mystery of the will of God concerning this. There we find ample instruction as to our heavenly standing, heavenly hopes, and heavenly conflict. The apostle does not complicate the church, uh, contemplate, sorry, the church <coughs> as a pilgrim on earth, but as sitting in heaven, not as toiling here, but resting there. He had raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It is not that he will do this, but he hath done it. When Christ was raised from the dead, all the members of the body were raised also. When he ascended into heaven, they ascended also. When he sat down, they sat down also. <coughs> that is, in the counsel of God, and to be actualized in process of time by the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Such was the thought and purpose of the divine mind concerning them. Believers did not know this at first. It is not unfolded by the ministry of the twelve, as seen in the Acts of the Apostles, because the testimony to Israel was still going on, and as long as the earth was the manifest scene of divine operation, so long as there was any ground of hope and connection with Israel, the heavenly mystery was held back. But when the earth had been abandoned, and Israel set aside, the apostle of the Gentiles from his prison at Rome writes to the church, and opens out all the glorious privileges connecting with its place in the heavenlies with Christ. When Paul arrived at Rome as a prisoner, he had, as it were, arrived at the end of all human things. He no longer thought of the church as exhibiting anything like the perfect testimony on earth. He knew how things would turn out as regards to the church's earthly path. He knew that it, that he knew that it would fare... He knew that it would fare with it, even as it had fared with the vessel in which he had sailed from Jerusalem to Rome. But his spirit was, was buoyed up by the happy assurance that nothing could touch the unity of the body of Christ, because it was a unity infallibly maintained by God himself. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple more verses for you. Um, Acts 20, verse 24 and 27. Uh, when Paul is departing from Ephesus for the last time. Um, check 24. Out. 24 and 27. But none of these things move me, neither count I dear my life unto myself, but I have finished my course with joy that the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel, the grace of God. So clearly is he testifying it before Acts 28? Yeah, and read verse 27. 27, uh, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. So Paul, it's indisputable, there's a few things to me that are indisputable, okay? Number one, is the mystery made known or mentioned in Romans? Yes. Is, so we have, we have the mystery here. Is the mystery referred to in 1 Corinthians? Not only is the mystery referred to, but also what? Christ. The body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for by one spirit are we all baptized into what? One body. Mm -hmm. One body. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, while these things are mentioned, are they fully developed here? No. Where are they fully developed? In Ephesians and Colossians. Okay? Now, the statements of Macintosh can easily, I can see where they could easily be taken to think that he's saying the church started where? Okay, now, yeah. Oh, I just found another verse I have marked earlier still. Acts 18.27 tells that the Ephesians were grace believers. Which verse? Acts 18.27. And when he was dis disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, whom when he was come, helped them much, which had, which had believed through grace. 
Yeah, the, the, there, I mean, there are, I appreciate that, Ryan. There, there are tons of verses that, that could lay this out. The question, the problem, the difficulty with Macintosh is whether or not he is explaining what we would now identify today, not him in his day, but whether or not what the way he explains this will, is is identified or could be should be or could be identified as a twenty eight position. Now, page ten. Acts 28 dispensationalist Stuart Allen quotes the preceding section from Macintosh. So he quotes the entire section that I just quoted. If you look at Stuart Allen's book, he quotes that entire section. Same, same section from Macintosh that we just read. Okay? He quotes the preceding section from Macintosh in his 1969 book, The Early Centuries and the Truth. Allen makes the following assertions regarding CHM's understanding of the book of Acts. Ultimately, Allen writes Macintosh, or views Macintosh, as an Acts 28 dispensationalist. The writer CHM clearly sees clearly the dispensational character of Acts with the people of Israel coming first right up to the last chapter. He realizes the truth of the great mystery revealed through Paul, the prisoner of the Gentiles, was not known or commented or commended at Acts 2. Neither in the ministry of Peter or the Twelve connected with it. Rather, the first unfolding of this divine secret after Israel's rejection at Acts 28. So Stuart Allen is saying that Macintosh said that the mystery is not made known until when? Now, we just studied Macintosh in his own words. Can you rightly say that, that that's what Macintosh said? No. I do not believe that you can for the reasons I've just gone over. Okay? But that's how Stuart Allen is viewing Macintosh and what he's saying here. Okay? Just one second, Steve. And made, and made known in the first epistles written after that event, namely those of Ephesians and Colossians. It is all the more remarkable when one remembers that this was written and taught a hundred years ago. How comes it then that this teaching is dubbed as ultra-dispensational by many of the present-day followers of the movement to which C.H. McIntosh was attached and looked upon as a concoction of Dr. Bollinger and Charles Welch. Now, I had the book on my shelf. I was going to bring it because I cut the quote off too soon because if you read the rest of the quote, I do believe Allen to be saying that he views Macintosh as an Acts 28 dispensationalist according to the terms of what that means in his day. Okay? Now, it is easy... Let's stop. Steve, you had a question. Is there any chance that he is seeing that from Macintosh or even Macintosh himself and Acts 28 people you know, there's a lot of ifs, ands, and whatevers in that question, are getting their position because they see these other statements as more of a build-up to the completion of the revelation rather than the knowledge of during the same time period. Can I hold Does that off? Make sense? Yeah, can I hold off my sure, answer yeah. on that? Because I think... I don't want to get, if we, if we get sidetracked, I don't think we're going to get to that in the lesson at, right. at a certain point. And if I don't answer it, ask me at the end. <laughs> okay. So, it's, page 10, it's easy to see why Allen would view Macintosh as an Acts 28 dispensationalist. Some of what C.H. Macintosh says is in line with the standard Acts 28 viewpoints. All of this raises the interesting question of what makes someone an Acts 28 dispensationalist. So what is it that makes somebody an Acts 28 dispensationalist? Okay, I've, I've wrestled with this a lot. What is, what do they, in order for somebody to be a believer in the Acts 28 position, what do they have to believe? Okay, well obviously number one, they have to view that Acts 28, 28 is what? The dispensational boundary of some sort. Okay, let's, let's read what I've got here. I don't want to get off track because I think I addressed it in the comments. So all of this raises the interesting question of what makes someone an Acts 28 dispensationalist. Michael Penny, author of Approaching the Bible and Acts 28 Dispensationalist, points out the tension between Macintosh's comments on Acts 28 and his application of all appalling epistles to the body of Christ. 
It would be wrong to give the impression that all or indeed any <coughs> of the above writers, one of which was Macintosh, uh, agreed with the detailed approach advocated in this book. There were, they were all dispensationalists, but more than that, they saw something of significance occurring at the end of Acts. Now let me stop. I see something of significance occurring at the end of the book of Acts. I do not see what occurs at the end of the book of Acts as the beginning of the church. I view it as the end of a, of a transition that began well before. Okay? So they, there's, there's always been amongst dispensationalists questions about what this means in Acts 28 28. So, go back, going back to Michael Penny's quote now. However, some of them did not relate their views on Acts with their comments on the epistles or letters written during Acts. For example, they might state that Israel was set aside in Acts 28, 25 through 27, and that the announcement of God's salvation was sent to the Gentiles in Acts 28, 28, signified the close of one dispensation and the start of the other. Uh, they might state that the letters of James, Peter, John, and Jude, as well as the letter of Hebrews, were for Israel. However, some continue to hold that all of Paul's letters con uh, concerned this dispensation. They failed to see that his earlier ones, the ones wrote during Acts, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Romans, were for that time. They involved the central people of Acts, Israel, the churches of that time were mixtures of Jews and Gentiles, with those of Hebrew descent still rightly occupying the first place and observing the law of Moses. We see tension between their comments on the Acts of the Apostles and their comments on the letters written during Acts with, uh, with a number of writers. It is there in C.H. McIntosh's The Life and Times of Elijah the Tishbite. So he's saying, if I'm understanding Penny correctly, he's saying that McIntosh is drawing a dispensational boundary here. But what he's not doing then is he's not following that up with dividing these epistles between the ones that were written during the Acts period and the ones that were written after the Acts period. Okay? Welsh is often cited with the discovery of the dispensational change in Acts 28-28. However, many who lived and wrote before him had seen the significance of the last pronouncement in Acts 28 of Isaiah 6, including Anderson, Bullinger, McIntosh, and many others. Some have suggested that Welsh's breakthrough was to recognize that if the dispensational change came at the end of Acts, it was inconsistent to treat the earlier letters of Paul as one with his later letters. To leave Paul's earlier letters in the Acts dispensation, and to consider his later ones as pertaining to the post-Acts dispensation, is consistent and far more sensible. However, Welsh may not have been the first to come to this conclusion. Both Macintosh and Holden had written up the difference between Paul's earlier and later ministries, although from their writings this does not seem as if they came to so clear-cut a view as Welsh. Now, anybody can read the early epistles of Paul and the later ones, and can you see that, they're not, that there's development? Okay? So, what, what's making, the, to me, here's the way I view this. What cements the Acts 28 position in stone is when they divide the epistles. Because when they divide the epistles, then they are creating all sorts of other questions like, well, what body of Christ is this in 1 Corinthians 12? Is it different from the one in Ephesians? Because then you have two bodies created. You have all sorts of things that are, that are going to become even bigger questions if you do this. So the question of, let's go back to the notes, whether or not C.H. McIntosh should rightly be viewed as an Acts 28 dispensationalist is difficult to say. His thoughts on the life and times of Elijah are modeled at best. C.H.M. CHM seems to view Paul as having known the unique contents of his gospel and mystery during the Acts period, However, the time had not come for it to be fully proclaimed. Did the, but, but did the council at Jerusalem, quoting him now, did the council at Jerusalem apprehend the, tr the truth of the church, of Jews and Gentiles being, being so truly formed in one body, as they were no more Jew or Gentile? I believe not. A few members might have heard it from who? 
So again, does he say, is C.H. McIntosh saying that Paul knew the mystery in Acts 15 and was telling a few people about it? Yes. yes. Second quote. Now Paul's departure may be looked upon as the immediate precursor of all this. The peculiar truth of which he was a depository could only be brought out in all its fullness and power in connection with the abandonment of earth and the manifest scene of divine operation. So again, does he know the mystery during the Acts period? Yes. yes. McIntosh is clearly saying that. These comments coupled with the fact that McIntosh does not distinguish between the Acts and post-Acts epistles, but accepts all the Pauline epistles as equally applying to the church, leads me to conclude, this is my conclusion now, okay, that C.H. McIntosh cannot rightly be viewed as an Acts 28 dispensationalist. As we have already seen, C.H.M. is definitely not an Acts 2 dispensationalist, so then what is he? I also cannot in good faith call McIntosh a mid-Acts dispensationalist because he shows many Acts 28 tendencies. I think that we can safely conclude that CHM was a Pauline dispensationalist. Okay, that's what I'm going to call him. Because I don't think he, I don't think he fits any, he's clearly not what? He's clearly not X2, and he's clearly not fitting hand and glove with the way that the X28 crowd identifies their position. But he also never says anything about a particular time between X2 and X28 when the stuff was made known and when it started. So because of the ambiguities, I think we can surely say he's not X2 without doubt, without question. Okay? I don't see him in line with, fully in line with everything the Acts 28 crowd has to say, but I don't see him in fairness either being as precise. Remember when we read Holden and he said that the revelation of the mystery encompassed the entire day of Paul and that he was making it known throughout the, throughout the, entire, the, the entire time period. So I'm going to, I think for me personally, I think it's appropriate to call McIntosh a Pauline dispensationalist. Does he understand a change with Paul? Yes. Does he understand that the revelation of the mystery was made known to Paul? Yes. Does he understand that the truth regarding the church and its heavenly position and all these things are not found anywhere else in the scripture but through the writings of the Apostle Paul? Yes. But when it comes to identifying a specific position, it's hard to do and be honest with what is here in, in what he actually said. So let me finish that quote and I'll take questions. So I think we can safely conclude that uh, McIntosh was a Pauline dispensationalist. That is, McIntosh understood that Paul was given a different commission than the one given to Peter in the Twelve. So the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of the Gentiles, was committed to the revelation of the mystery concerning the heavenly purpose and calling of the church the body of Christ. He viewed the early chapters of Acts as the kingdom being offered to the nation of Israel. On these points, McIntosh is explicitly clear despite his lack of consistent clarity over where the dispensational boundary should be drawn. Okay. Any questions or comments on that before we finish this up on McIntosh? Norm. Are there any people today, or any is there any group in particular that takes the view that you just stated where they are appalling, but they don't designate uh, a point... Not that I've read. Okay. I'm not, not that I've read. <coughs> Anybody else? Mike? Just so I understand, do you, um, when is Israel set aside in your view then? I mean, totally Moami. Oh. I think it's Acts 7. Okay. So then you understand, so, so you think Paul then had a a two-fold ministry during the rest of the book of Acts, then? Is that, what, is that how the transition works? I know you told me. I think, we'll get, let's, get, let's get three passages. Get, get, um, get Acts 13 in one hand, Acts 18 and Acts 28, and Romans. Actually, why don't you get Romans first? 
Romans uh, chapter 11. First of all, I believe that when Stephen stands up uh, in Acts chapter 7 on the day of Pentecost, and the, the text clearly says that he's full of the Holy Ghost, and he looks up steadfastly to heaven, and the, the Sanhedrin, the leadership of Israel, rushes out there and kills him. What do they, they do to him? Stone. They stone him to death. Okay. At this point, has Israel rejected the witness of God the Father to them in the Old Testament through the prophets? Has Israel rejected God the Son during His earthly ministry? Yes. The Holy Spirit is sent to the nation in Acts chapter 2, empowers them, the twelve apostles, to go out and offer the kingdom to the nation of Israel. And what do they do to Stephen? Stone. They stone him. I believe at that point, what's known as the unpardonable sin is committed by the nation of Israel, national Israel. Okay? It's at that point, I believe, that God renders Israel in unbelief. And Israel has to be rendered in unbelief. Romans 11. Romans chapter 11, verse, uh, 20, verse, uh, verse uh, 28. As concerning the gospel, they are, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, notice, yet now have obtained mercy through their what? Well, when do the Gentiles, how do the Gentiles get mercy? Israel's unbelief. They get, un, they get mercy through the unbelief of Israel. When is Paul writing the book of Romans? Before or after Acts 28? Before. Before. So clearly have, has Israel already been rendered in unbelief in order for him to be even addressing this epistle to the Romans? Yes, verse 32. Okay, then go to verse, read the next verse. Even, at, even so have these also now not believed. So even now Israel's not listening. That through their mercy they also may obtain mercy. Verse 32, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. So before the body of Christ can be formed, before God can have mercy upon Jew and Gentile alike, Israel has to what? Fall. I believe the fall of Israel takes place there. Because by there, Acts 9, the guy, the chief of sinners that's consenting unto the death of Stephen is saved on the road to Damascus. Acts chapter 26 tells you that on the road to Damascus, the Lord Jesus Christ said to Paul that you'll be a testimony of those things which I have, which I have, which you have seen, and the things that I will yet reveal unto you. Okay? So I believe that the nation of Israel is rendered in unbelief in Acts chapter 7. They fall here. Okay? Then you have the rest of the book of Acts. You have the, these epistles that are written during the Acts period while Paul is out here having his apostolic uh, ministry and, and so on. So I believe that Israel falls in Acts 7, starts a, a process. Go to, go to Romans 11, look at verse uh, 12. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, notice, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much they're, more their fullness... Now, so if I were drawing this, I'm just going to draw this off to the side. I believe in Acts 7, Israel falls. They're rendered in unbelief. And from there on through the rest of the book of Acts, Israel is what? Diminished. Diminished. Okay? So what in Acts... Why can't I spell? In Acts 28, you don't have the dispensational boundary. What you have is the end of this period of what? Diminishing. Now go go back to go go to Acts thirteen. What was that? What was that? It was the pipes. It was, I, I heard oh. it earlier. Is that what we heard earlier? I heard it earlier, but I was in here by myself. Acts thirteen. Look at Acts thirteen, verse. Um, now now let, let let's. Okay, I think I can do this with enough time. I still want to finish these few points so we can be done with. But this, this is a great question. Acts chapter 13. Now, you, we don't have time to do it, but you need to compare. Okay? You need to compare Peter's sermon in Acts 2 with Paul's sermon in Acts 13. Because they are almost, they are almost identical sermons until you get to the end. Okay? Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 37. 
But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of what? Sins. Sins. Now notice verse 39. And by him all that believe are justified from all things which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Is that the gospel of the grace of God? Yes. Justification by grace through faith without the law of Moses, without the deeds of the law, without the works of the law, without needing to keep the law. Drop down to verse um, 44. And, this, and, the next sa- and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spoke against those things uh, which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it, is, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it away from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to who? Yes. So Acts 13, where is Paul in Acts 13? Geographically. Antioch. He's in Antioch. Okay. Where's Antioch? Antioch is in Asia Minor. Okay? But he says, because it, the Jews don't want to hear the testimony, he turns to who? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. Come to Acts chapter 18. And he reasoned in this... By the way, where is he? Corinth. Okay, so Acts 18 now. He's in Corinth. Where's Corinth? Corinth is in Macedonia, right? It's on the other side. It's not in Asia, it's on the other side. So is he in, is he in a new geographic region? In, in Acts 18. Yes. Okay. Acts 18, verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks that when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Is he preaching to the Jews the revelation of the mystery here? Yes. What's it say he was teaching them? Jesus. Look, before any Jewish person can get saved, do they first have to acknowledge who the Lord was? So that's what he's teaching them. Look at verse 6. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto who? So he says once in Asia Minor that he's going to go to the Gentiles. He says once in Acts chapter 18 that that he's going uh, to the Gentiles. And now Acts chapter 28. Go to Acts chapter 28 verse 28. Acts 28, 28, Be it known unto you, therefore, that the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, and that they will what? Where is he at there? So look at it. Israel falls in Acts 7. They are diminished throughout the remainder of the book of Acts. Three times, in three geographic areas, the Apostle Paul announces the fact that he's turning to who? The Gentiles. Acts 28 is not the beginning of the body of Christ. It is the end of this period of what? Diminishing. Okay? That's why I'm saying to you that as I evaluate what McIntosh said, he's clearly not Acts 2. He says some things that are consistent with Acts 28, but not totally. And he doesn't really say anything in the intermittent period about where he feels the church actually starts. So that's why I'm saying that I think we're most comfortable, I'm most comfortable at least calling him a Pauline dispensationalist. Okay? So I'm like, I hope that answered your question. At least to some degree. What's that? What's that? It helped. Okay. Now, and I should tell, I should say also that while this is happening, all of these epistles here are being what? Written. Written. And it is true that after this diminishing is over, that you have the full revelation of what? The mystery. The mystery made known in those books over there. 
But what these books tell you about fully is already being discussed here. And I know I just really messed that chart up for you, especially for you guys that are watching maybe on the internet. But I, I hope that you at least are kind of conceptualizing with me what I'm saying. So top of page 12. Macintosh understood that the current dispensation would last until the rapture of the church. <clears throat> he was not ashamed, for he knew that Christ, though broken in pieces here, was nevertheless held in the everlasting gra grasp of the Son of God, and that he was able to keep it, keep it until the happy moment of its rapture, he's talking about the church, to meet him in the air. And then as the church's hope, we look for the Savior. Not for the accomplishment of any earthly event. Thank God, believers are not taught to wait for the revelation of the Antichrist, but for the appearing of the blessed Son of God, who loved them and gave Himself for them. Christians should understand that they have nothing to look for save the rapture, their rapture, into the air to meet the Lord. The world may ridicule the idea, and false teachers may build up systems hostile to it, for the purpose of shaking the faith of the simple-minded, but through grace we will continue to comfort one another with the assurance that the days are at hand, uh, uh, sorry, and the effect of every vision. So does he understand a pre-trib rapture? Yep. He says, the blessed hope of the church. In addition, Macintosh seems to have understood some things about, the, about positional truth and the believer standing in Christ. Macintosh wrote, but it may be asked, how can believers be said to be seated in heavenly places when they are yet in the world struggling with its difficulties, its sorrows, and temptations? <clears throat> the same question may be asked in reference to the important doctrine of Romans 6. How can believers be represented as dead to sin when they find sin working in them continually? The answer to both is one and the same. God sees the believer as dead with Christ. And he also sees the church as raised with him and seated in Christ. But it is the province of but it is the province of faith that led the soul into the reality of both. Reckon yourselves to be what God tells you you are. The believer's power to sub, to subdue indwelling corruption consists in his reckoning himself to be dead to it. And his power of separation from the world consists in his reckoning himself to be raised with Christ and seated in Him. The church, according to God's estimation, has as little to do with sin as the world at sin and the world as Christ has. But God's thoughts and our, our apprehensions are very different things. He says, How do you have victory over sin? <coughs> you reckon it to be so. You reckon it to be true that you have died with Christ, that you have been resurrected with Christ and that the body of sin has been destroyed through the sacrifice of Christ, and that you no longer have to serve what? Sin. sin. You reckon it to be so, and you act upon it by faith, is what he's saying. Amen. Brilliant, brilliant way of saying it. The church of Christendom has fallen tragically short of a true scriptural understanding of the nature of the church, the body of Christ, according to Macintosh. In short, there will, all, there will always only be a minority of believers who comprehend the heavenly character and calling of the church as presented by the Apostle Paul. Isn't that the truth? He says, We must never forget that every tendency of human mind not only falls short, but actually stands opposed to all this divine truth about the church. We have seen how long it has ere man could take hold of it, how it has forced out, as it were, and pressed upon him, and we have only to glance at the history of the church for the first 18 centuries to see how feebly it has held and how speedily it was let go. The heart naturally clings to earth, and the thought of an earthly uh, corporation is attractive to it. Hence... We may expect that the truth of the church's heavenly character will only be apprehended and carried out by a small and feeble minority. It is not to be supposed that the Protestant reformers exercised their thoughts on this momentous subject. 
They were made in, they were made instrumental in bringing out the, the the precious doctrine of justification by faith from amid the rubbish of Romish Romanish separate uh, superstition. Sorry. And also in letting upon it human conscience the light of inspiration and opposition to the false and ensnaring dogmas of human tradition. This was doing not a little. Yet it must be admitted, the position and hopes of the church engaged not their attention. So, Macintosh is saying that Luther and the boys understand justification by faith. But did they say anything about the church's heavenly position and calling? No. And he says, in fact, it's always and only going to be a minority of believers that understand these truths, is what he's saying. Okay? It would have been a bold step from the church of Rome to the church of God. And yet it will be found in the end that there is not distinct natural growth between the two. For every church, or to speak more accurately, every religious corporation, reared up and carried on by the wisdom and resources of men be its principle ever so pure and ever so hostile to Catholicism, will be found when judged by the Spirit and in the light of heaven to partake more or less of the element of the Romanish system. Woo. He's, uh, he, he's not fooling around here. Okay, The heart clings to earth and will with difficulty be led to believe that the only time wherein God ceases to be manifestly occupied about earth that the only unnoticed, uh, unnoticed interval in the history of time is just the period wherein He, by the Holy Ghost, is gathering out the church to form the body of Christ. And moreover, when God was dealing publicly with earth, the church, properly so called, was not contemplated, and that when He shall resume His public dealings with the earth and with Israel, the church will be out of the scene. Sects are not the church, nor religious parties the body of Christ. Hence, to be attached to the sects is not to find ourselves in some of those numerous tributary streams which are rapidly flowing onward in the terrible vortex of which we read in Revelation 17 and 18. Let us not be deceived. Principles will work and systems will find their proper level. Prejudice will operate and hinder the carrying out of those heavenly principles of which we speak. Um, yeah. He's not playing around, is he? What's he saying? Summarize, what, what, is, what is he saying about the state of the church? <clears throat> chaos. He's saying it's total, complete chaos. Why is it total, complete chaos? Yesterday. Yeah. It's total complete chaos because they haven't understood the message and ministry of who? Paul. Paul. Now he's writing this at some point between 1870 and 1900. Well over 100 years ago. Okay? In a candid section, closing this lesson down now, in a candid section at the close of the life and times of Elijah, CHM makes a powerful statement about all those who would resolve to stand for Pauline authority. <clears throat> Quoting McIntosh, Those who will maintain Paul's gospel will find themselves like him, deserted and despised amid the splendid pomp and glitter of the world. The clashing of ecclesiastical systems, the jarring of sects, and the din of religious controversy will surely drown the feeble voices of those who would speak of the heavenly calling and rapture of the church. Folks, what we're doing here in this assembly, when, when, when the world looks at it, when the religious system looks at it, do they view what we're doing as highly insignificant compared to everything that's going on? Okay, McIntosh is saying, listen, if you're going to stand for this, there's always going to be bigger groups with more money and more influence that are going to drown you out, is what he's saying. But, let the spiritual man who finds himself in the midst of all this sad and heart-sickening confusion, remember the following simple principle. Every system of ecclesiastical discipline and every system of prophetic interpretation which would connect the church in any one way with the world or the things of the world must be contrary 
to the spirit and principles of that great mystery developed by the Holy Ghost in the Apostle of the Gentiles. I don't know how I could have said that any better myself, Steve. Going back to Macintosh, you say he's clearly not an out in Acts 2, he's clearly not in Acts 28, and you're comfortable saying he's a Pauline. So, basically he's a mid acts Or is that not clear or safe to say? I am not. I, I am not. There's, 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 that, that, that's the that's the middle ground. Generally, yes. But again, because some of this stuff is points more towards twenty-eight. I. It's not. It points toward it, and I can see why somebody would say that that's where he's at. But if you read everything he said, that's not totally he, what he's saying. He, he, okay. Exactly. So. Because there is enough ambiguity in what he said, I'm not, I'm not, I was comfortable with Holden identifying him based on what he said as a, as a, as a mid-axe dispensationalist, according to today's standards. He would have never said that, understand that. He, in 1870, when he wrote that book, he would have never said, oh, I'm a mid-axe dispensationalist. He never would have said that, okay? Mike? When do you, when do you think Macintosh thinks uh, Israel was set aside? I think he set things to set aside here. He doesn't say anything about a Jewish uh, elements at all in this uh, this last quote that you have in italics here. A summary quote that bothers me a little bit. What bothers you? He's, he's, he would say something like, "We have nothing to do with Jewish things at all." If if uh, if you really understood a. Um, the heavenly position of the church, and he doesn't say that at all in here. That's okay. So, so that bothers you how? Well, he's he's he still he still seems to think that Israel is, or, or, um, is that we're still part of Israel somehow, and I. Uh, I, I would say no. Based on the other quotes we've read, if you isolate that one quote, he, I, I could sort of see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, well, it is a summary statement. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if if you read the conclusion to the Life and Times of Isaiah, there's a there's a introduction statement in italics at the beginning, and then there's a summary statement at the end in italics at the end. If you go back to the beginning of the notes, you'll see that I quoted in the notes. The opening statement in italics, and at the end, the ending statement that was in italics. Okay. So he views these, it's clear to me that as you read what he says, he views these two statements as sort of a summary introduction and a summary conclusion of what he's trying to say. But an Acts, one, an Acts 2 person could go along with this summary statement. Uh, somebody like Schaefer. True. Uh, but there's, there's other clear statements where he says that th this is the kingdom being offered here. Yeah, I know. I'll so, there. conclusion now, Acts 14, page 14. While I do not view Macintosh as a full-fledged Acts 28 dispensationalist, he sir, his views certainly are a precursor to the views of Bollinger later in his later ministry and Charles Welch. Okay. Now I got a whole series of teachings I'm going to teach about rightly dividing Bollinger. <laughs> okay, and that's going to be done after uh, after a break because you've got to rightly divide Bollinger because what Bollinger says before 1908 is not the same thing as what he says after 1908. And if you don't understand that, you're going to totally miss the point on him. Okay, that's, I didn't realize that was going to be so funny. But, you know. When one considers the works we have surveyed thus far, it becomes apparent. That the Acts 2, Darby and Trotter, mid-Acts Holden, early Acts 28, if you want to be Macintosh that way, dispensational views are all in print before the year 1900. This understanding gives richness to the historical development of dispensational theology, apart from the institutional cookie-cutter approach that has far too long dominated these discussions. Much more was known and in print and at an earlier date than many students of dispensational theology have heretofore realized. 
In our next lesson, we will consider another work, E.W. Bollinger's 1895 publication, The Mystery. Folks, when you look at what's really going on here, there is a very diverse understanding of dispensational truth that is already out there by the time you get to the year 1900. Okay? Um, and it's being worked out and flushed out and developed and refined uh, over a process, over the, the virtually the whole length of the 19th century. Okay? But it's five after, and we need to quit. <laughs> and next week we will begin looking at some other things of Bollinger's. Alright? So, thanks for your attention. Perhaps two words.